Hi, everybody. Welcome to Ad Week Together. Uh, we are recording live today. Uh, I have a guest here, Diana Pearl. She is our uh, she's our managing editor of our Brand Week Quarterly magazine, as well as our deputy brand editor uh, for all of Ad Week. So she is immersed in brands and in particularly retail. So we're going to be talking about retail and how the coronavirus um, is is playing out for different retailers right now. So no shortage of things to dig into there. I'm Stephanie Patrick. I'm the executive editor of Ad Week. And we have a lot of you tuning in today from all over the world. I'm just taking a look here. We've got Germany, Italy, California, Buenos Aires, Florida, India, Paris, Chile. So thank you so much for with us. Um, this was just an opportunity for us to get to chat about one time in the U.S., uh, the different time zones represented as well. Chance to bring together our experts on staff as well as experts in the industry uh, to talk about sort of our new normal and how it's all playing out. So, Diana, thank you for joining us today. You're in Brooklyn and I'm in Brooklyn, so <laughs> we're the we're the Brooklyn bureau today, right? Yes, yes. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Yeah. So I want to, you had a, a great story that just came out last night. Um, and it came from a question that you asked, I think, you know, a couple of weeks ago, as all of this was starting to happen, uh, you wrote to me and said, can e-commerce carry the retail industry during the coronavirus? That was sort of your question. Like, can can e-commerce as as we see, uh, you know, brick and mortar stores have to temporarily close, is e-commerce capable of, of handling the load? Um, that story came out last night. So what's what's the answer? What's the verdict? It seems that the answer is a little bit, but not completely. Um, you know, there are some brands that are perhaps a little bit better positioned to um, carry the load in terms of e-commerce. You know, you think about direct-to-consumer brands that really, they grew up online. Most of their customers know where to find them. You know, they're, they do have some a brick and mortar presence, but it's really more about community building rather than selling product. So you look at brands like that and you say, okay, they're well positioned. E-commerce is at the heart of their business. Um, you know, this closing, maybe the four stores they have nationwide, maybe won't have too much of an effect. Um, but then you look at brands that really, maybe they have an e-commerce presence, but they never really built it up and they really relied on those in-store sales and they're being hit a lot harder. Um, and then there are brands that, you know, are super popular right now a Purell or a Charmin, but they don't have their own e-commerce capabilities. You know, they only sell through wholesale platforms or and in stores like Target or Amazon. And so you look at stores or brands like that, and it's like, are they missing out on a huge opportunity to sell and also to get product into the hands of consumers at the right price? You know, there's all these reports of price gouging, especially on those hot in-demand items. Whereas, you know, if Purell itself had its own e-commerce website, they could sell at the right price and get products in consumer hands. Um, so it's really about, you know, speeding up sort of the digital revolution brands that didn't pay attention to this or didn't pay as much attention to this as they perhaps should have before are now sort of forced to reckon with that decision and maybe know they can't get things together for this particular pandemic. Um, you know, it's all happening so fast and it's hard to, you know, completely build up um, an e-commerce platform within weeks, of course, but maybe this will have them rethinking their digital strategy um, and sort of moving things faster. But, you know, as powerful as e-commerce is, and it's definitely the direction the industry is heading, brick and mortar is still a really powerful tool as well. Um, and it's still how the majority of Americans shop. So even as e-commerce sales might be increasing a bit, it's perhaps not enough to completely carry the industry, especially in a time of economic uncertainty. Yeah, you know, I think it's so interesting. I know, you know, a year or two ago when really people were starting to call on brands to build the direct relationships with their consumers. I was a bit um, skeptical and particularly with brands that you would typically buy at a grocery store because I think from the consumer perspective, if I do a big you know shopping trip, grocery shopping trip to stock up my household, I might be buying 60 items. Do I really want to go to you know 60 different brands to buy them all individually? Um, but it is interesting that we're, we're living through a time where those brands who do have a direct relationship um, who aren't having to sell through an Amazon or a Target? Um, like you're saying, are there? Do you have? Uh, are there any examples of brands who you're seeing uh, who who do have that e-commerce strategy in place that's paying off right now? You know, I look at a brand like an Everlane, which is a fashion retailer, and obviously, fashion is is not top of minds for people right now, unless it's loungewear. But you know, they have a direct relationship with their consumers. They only have a few stores. 
years um, and they've been running certain promotions that I know just anecdotally, I'm hearing it's like everyone on social media seems to be, this is the time they're investing in their Everlane jeans. And, you know, they, they don't have to rely on another retailer. Maybe their store's closed and now they're not getting all the foot traffic. It's really just about that relationship that they had already built with their consumer. Um, so I think a brand like that is in a good place to sort of weather this storm. hit retail are going to be by brick and mortar stores temporarily closing. We still don't quite know how long that's going to be. Um, but do you do you have any sense of what it'll be like after the dust settles? Will all these brick and mortar locations reopen or um, is that uncertain? It's a bit uncertain. And I think it really depends on what financial position the stores were in before. And we are one of our retail reporters, which are calling, did a bunch of great stories about stores that might be at risk. And that this could sort of be the um, the kiss of death for them. You know, one example is Neiman Marcus. They have a lot of debt, and they're a store that really relies on that creating that luxury experience in store rather than online. So you know, you have your your personal shopper, you have the restaurants, and all that sort of thing. And when you don't have that environment, you know, you can translate that to e-commerce. And so with the stores closed, you know, are people looking to Neiman Marcus in the same way as that they went to their you know their mall or they to a store in their cities downtown to really get that experience. Also, just luxury shopping right now is, you know, it's not something that's top of mind for people. There's a lot of economic uncertainty. People aren't really leaving their houses. It, it doesn't really seem like the time to, to splurge. Um, you know, there's also brands like J. Crew that had their IPO plan for Madewell, one of their sister brands, um, this spring, and their refinancing was tied to that. So if they can't get that refinancing and the Madewell IPO keeps getting pushed, that could put them in a vulnerable position as well. Um, so really anything non-essential, like beauty, footwear, apparel, is sort of at risk right now because it's just not top of consumers' minds. And everyone is focused on spending money on their essentials. Yeah, it seems like this double-edged sword, if people have time to shop, uh, at least online, but they also might be worried about their pocketbook. Definitely, yeah. definitely. I, uh, Diana, so we're getting some some questions and comments uh, from our, our LinkedIn viewers in particular. And um, I, I wanna bring up one uh, is the idea of competition. Uh, there's some new competition coming into the market at this time. Um, this is from Autumn Joy, uh, who says it's creating competition too. An example is um, Tito's Liquor, for example, is creating hand sanitizer to compete with sold out. So that's kind of, you any any thoughts on the competitiveness at this time? Yeah, I mean, I think for products like hand sanitizer that are in such high demand, you know, it's really like you take what you can get. I think people will take their nose hand sanitizer, they take their, you know, Estee Lauder hand sanitizer, and they take the classic Purell. It's really about getting your hands on what you can. And for that, I don't think there's going to be a lasting effect because I can't imagine after coronavirus is over, Tito's is going to decide that hand, hand sanitizer big business and it's something they should they should be creating so yes yeah. there are other options but i think when supply is limited it's less about you know being picky about which brand it's more about what can i get my hands on in this moment yeah that that is true and um melanie long i uh, 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 chimed in here on linkedin with a comment she just said your your quote that fashion brands are not top of mind right now except maybe lounge wear she just said yes capital letters and i think that's <laughs> interesting a colleague of ours and i were talking about the fact that the only um fashion ads we're getting served on instagram right now are for for lounge wear it's really funny how it shifted from from workwear to lounge um i want to get back to what you were talking about um in terms of uh just just the fact that retail overall has been challenged heading into this and certain retailers in particular are, are coming into this where they've already they're already in a weakened position. Um, you and your team have been writing a lot about the the quote unquote retail apocalypse um, and just how many store closures we were seeing before coronavirus hit. Um, do you think that you know this could be sort of the final nail for some? Um, are you anticipating uh, more bankruptcies and sort of permanent closures? Yeah, definitely. I think it's inevitable. I mean, this is hurting every industry and retail is definitely not exempt from that. Um, and, you know, one of the sources I spoke to for the story I wrote yesterday, you know, said that for a lot of retailers, it's sort of been death by a thousand cuts. And this is kind of like that one last gash, so to speak, um, that is could set some of these retailers, you know, closed for good. Um, you know, like I said, J. Crew is an 
example of a retailer that's vulnerable. Neiman Marcus is an example of a retailer that's vulnerable. Land's End, GNC, you know, some of these distressed retailers, rating agencies have been looking at and concerned about for a bit. Um, you know, having to close all your brick and mortar locations across your primary market, the United States, um, and you know, for some of these that have locations in Europe, having to close those as well. I mean, it's huge. It, it's that res represents the majority of where their sales come from. And even though, you know, I've seen uh, like J crew running promotion after promotion this week, and I'm sure people are shopping online. Um, it's just, it, it can't fully, um, make up for it, especially, like I said, at a time where there's a lot of economic uncertainty, people aren't thinking about their discretionary spend quite as much. Um, so it's just, there's a lot of vulnerability for these brands, right? Now. Yeah. And I hear, um, some of our, our, uh, viewers, uh, mention the audio so I apologize I'll try to troubleshoot that but hopefully you can uh, you can still hear us um, uh, Diana I, I have a question about that in terms of some of the, the discounts that we're seeing from retailers I know I know you know uh, you you've mentioned just to me that if you if you if you do have some discretionary income this is a really good time to mm -hmm. be buying because we're seeing these discounts and I've been wondering what's driving that is it that they are in danger and so they're trying you know they're 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 you know almost li not liquidating but they're you know deeply discounting things to try to boost sales or is it that they see an opportunity with people at home people shopping online um and they're trying to kind of capitalize on it? yeah i think it's a little bit of both i do think people are spending more time at home um you know they they have a lot of time to browse maybe they're bored they're making purchases but I also think even if a retailer isn't necessarily in danger, this is an uncertain time. And there's no question that there is going to be a hit to their profits and a hit to their revenue with having to close brick and mortar stores. You know, example of that that I look at is Nordstrom. Um, last week, they put everything on their website 20%, 25% off. That is unheard of. I have never seen Nordstrom do a discount like that in my entire life. And I'm saying this not even just as a retail reporter and editor, I think it as a shopper. <laughs> um, but Nordstrom is not a store. No, it's not JC where you know, like they're you know they're one breath away from from bankruptcy and closure. So I think for them it's more about sharing up their business and yes, taking advantage of a time where people might be shopping, spending a little bit more money. Um, but at the same time, you know, just making sure giving people a reason to shop and a reason to come to their store versus another when everyone is sort of fighting for those dollars right now. Yeah. I um I I can't let you go without talking about Amazon. So um, I should say we do have a reporter, Lisa Lacey, who is solely dedicated um, to covering Amazon and some of the big box stores. And actually, I'd love to bring her on this program next week just to do a deep dive there. But Diana, what can you what can you tell us? I mean, I imagine this this has to be um, a, a huge moment for them. Yeah, I mean, Amazon is really poised to be the big winner in all of this. And any increase in e-commerce spending is likely all going straight to them because it's all about essentials. You know, it's all about stocking up on toilet paper and cleaning supplies and even things like puzzles where, you know, you wouldn't think, you immediately think, where do I buy a puzzle? You look to a place like Amazon that has a little bit of everything. You know, you don't think about Puzzles R Us or, you know, that's just something I made up. But <laughs> you don't think about a specialty retailer in that moment order a puzzle last night and like they're all on back order on on amazon until april 9th i think was the earliest that i could get a yeah. puzzle which blew me away yeah. yeah they're really getting everything from the essentials to the fun items and with that they're seeing a huge increased demand they're hiring a hundred thousand new workers but that demand is starting to wear on them and a little sneak preview is um lisa lacy as you mentioned she has an amazing story coming on sort of what that strain looks like for amazon um, and you know, these customers, these prime members are used to getting their deliveries in a day or two. And with that strain and with that delay, now it can be up to a week. It can be multiple days, you know, it, things are on back order. And so it's sort of having to adjust the expectations of customers, um, that really Amazon made those expectations for themselves. Uh, and I know I mean, it's sort of like the, this kind of influx of business can be a blessing and a curse. Um, can you say anything about just how their effort to scale up has gone both in terms of you know staffing you know you know staffing up in order to handle the demand and then also employees and yeah I mean, there have been complaints from amazon workers that they're not doing enough to help them and you know it is just inevitable as the pandemic continues that more amazon warehouse workers will be sick 
Um, and that's something that they're having to deal with. And if they are creating warehouses, if someone's sick and, and really doing deep sanitization, but you know, it's really an ongoing discussion and ongoing complaints are being heard from workers that maybe the company just isn't, isn't doing enough to protect them. Yeah. And just on the, you know, on the uh, other end of the spectrum, you, you mentioned earlier a little bit about um, direct to consumer brands. We, uh, we just had, you know, right before all this started, we had our challenger brand summit in New York uh, a few weeks ago where we were talking about uh, direct to consumer, you know, we were talking to and about direct to consumer brands, talking with a lot of CMOs and coronavirus was not yet really a huge part of you know their their conversations they were having about strategy, but um, how? What are you hearing from D 2 C brands about how they're navigating this? Does this change the strategy or landscape for them, or are they well positioned enough that they're staying the course? I think they are well positioned, and from what I've heard, you know, for the most part, they're staying the course. We are seeing some of these brands, um, you know, do charitable giving and donating, you know, ten percent of their proceeds to. Uh, charitable organizations to help with the coronavirus. So I think they're even a position in a position now where they feel like they can give up 10% of um, you know their proceeds to these organizations. And I think that speaks to the fact that their businesses are strong online and that's really where consumers are finding them. And you know, I look at brands that are really about loungewear or homeware. And this is a time for people, you know, maybe to, to purchase those things. And I think those brands are in a in a good position as well. But yeah, definitely not re relying too much on brick and mortar is you know something that and it's funny because I feel like in direct to consumer there's been a lot of talk about how these brands need to get more into brick and mortar they need to do more they need to, they can't just exist online and now with all retailers being forced to only exist online it shows that you know having a strong digital presence is just as if not more important than a strong brick and mortar presence yeah I love um you know something you mentioned and a theme that has come up on this show every day has been brands uh, taking this opportunity to build goodwill. So I think it's interesting that you're seeing those donations happen as well, um, you know, both doing it for the right reasons in the short term, um, but I think um, short up some loyalty, uh, you know, with customers in the long term. Um, so Diane, we, we always end on a, on a tip uh, or something, yeah. something a bit lighthearted. And you being our brands and retail guru, I want to know what what are you shopping for right now? What what's coming to? <laughs> um, I can't lie. With the Nordstrom twenty five percent off sale, I did take the opportunity to replace a pair of sunglasses that I had that broke on me last summer. I'd had them for like eight years, and I thought about just going to get them fixed, but it was it was really like a true snap in half. So um, when I went, they were like, "You can't do anything with these." So I took the opportunity to replace the sunglasses, and I'm thankful for the twenty five percent off because they're they're not a style that goes on sale often. So. Um, <laughs> and of course, you know, doing my, you know, every other week or every week trip to the grocery store, that's sort of the focus of my shopping as well. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I've seen my shopping shift a couple of weeks ago. It was all about buying like bleach. But last week mm -hmm. was all about getting my pantry in order. This week I've started to get my home in order and bought some exercise equipment, uh, indoor trampoline for my son and a little stair stepper for myself. And actually something we didn't talk about, but if I'm trying a... Uh, subscription boxes for the first time because oh, I'm finding nice. because I can't go out and shop and I'm wanting to just you know do a little something to treat myself mm -hmm. in the madness so I signed up for Fit Fun and Cause Box um, and so anyway yeah the it, it'll be interesting to see. I think every week to week um, the you know we're seeing the shifts and what kind of items are running out and what what people yeah. are focused on on getting so Definitely. Diana Thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreci appreciate you bringing um, the insights into how this is playing out in retail. Um, and I wanna thank uh, all of our viewers for joining us. Um, tomorrow, tune in at one o'clock Eastern. You'll see Chris Ahrens, our managing editor, who was here earlier in the week, is gonna be talking with Sarah Jurdy, our publishing editor. Um, so a completely different part of the industries that we cover, um, really looking at media and publishers and how this is all playing out there. Uh, I want you to know how you can get in touch with us. So you can send us an email at adweektogether at adweek.com. Um, I would love to hear from you just regarding what questions do you have? What topics would be useful to you? Um, I'm happy to bring your questions onto the show and answer them and your topics will help us 
um, program this show going forward. So thanks for your input. Also feel free, free to drop a comment in LinkedIn, on, face back, uh, on Facebook, and um, also on uh, IGTV, on Instagram, uh, several places you can get this. And finally, you can find all of our episodes um, on adweek.com at adweek.com forward slash together. So thanks so much. I hope you all have a good afternoon, a good evening, a good morning, wherever you happen to be tuning in from, and we'll see you tomorrow.